Hi YouTube, uh, it's Godly here. So today I'm talking about what the title says. Life is like playing a game of chess. Now yesterday, not yesterday, um, a few days ago, I was walking around in a in a shop when I saw a journal among you know, the book section. It's just a normal journal, but it had a, a cover to it that had um, a writing on saying, Life is like a game of chess. Life is like playing a game of chess. That's that's exactly what he said. So when I saw, when I read that, that statement, I had to stop. Like I was stunned that this saying is a thing because it's something, it reminded me that it's something that I already knew, but not because I've been told by a man or anybody. It's something that I go to find out that I had about from a vision that I had in 2022, the beginning of 2022 when my father passed away. Now at a time I was overcome by grief for my dad. Uh, I, I didn't, a bit of a, back sto back, a background story, I didn't have a relationship with my dad after my parents separated. Uh, he told me I was on about eight or nine. That's the last time I saw him alive. And I still remember that particular scene when I was saying goodbye to him and the exact words he had used on me. And long story short, after my parents separated, there was so much that happened, uh, um, um, a lot of issues between parents and then the children got lost in the middle, we got lost in the middle, got caught up in their fight. Uh, long story short, uh, about a year before my father's passing, I was ministering somewhere. This was during the pandemic. I talked about this before. I was delivering a message about the honoring of parents. And after I ministered, I had the Holy Spirit say to me, look, that message was not for your congregation like you thought. It was for you. It's time to go back and find your father. It's time to go back and obtain a blessing from your father. Now, what the Holy Spirit did not tell me was that my father had about a year before he dies. I didn't, like I said, I last saw him when I was eight, nine, and I was totally cut off from him and never heard from him until like a year before he died. And I only went back because the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, look, go back. And he gave me specific instructions that when you go back, ask him to bless you. He didn't tell me that he was going to die, but he told me, ask him to, to bless you. Let him speak upon you the blessing of the father. Now, I despise my father up until that time because obviously he believed in different things. He was so much uh, engraved into the occult. So I cut myself off him because as I look, darkness and light have nothing in common like what the Bible says. But the Lord spoke to me and gave me a different view that look, regardless, if that was someone else, you could easily cut them off. But this is your father. This is a parent. The kind of blessing they hold for you, this, despite of their lifestyle or how they've lived, what they believe in, it does not matter. They brought you into this world. And that's why, even in normal terms, a parent, especially a mother, they never lose their parental responsibility 100%. Even when a child is adopted, they hold parental responsibility to a certain degree because they deserve that respect. Without them, you wouldn't exist. Hence why maybe some people call parents your God on earth or something along those lines. But anyway, long story short, because I didn't have a relationship with my father, he was a very good dad when we were growing up until my parents died. And then when I went back in his life, I was focused to show him a good time, he tried to do a number of things that would make a, you know, a parent proud. It's, I was doing things as though deep down in me, I knew that I was running out of time because... My dad had grown very, very old. He was now in his 80s, I think mid-80s. My dad has always been old as far as I'm concerned. From the time I was little, my dad was always old. To me, he looked old. He looked like he could be old enough to be my granddad. So my mom married him very, very young. So anyways, long story short, my dad died. And as you can tell, I'd only had like a period of a, a, a year to build a relationship with him. And we got on really well. But... The very first day that I went back to speak to him, I remember the instruction God had spoken to me. Say, look, I asked him, Dad, pray for me. And was that what? I think nobody in his life has ever asked for prayers. And I was so challenged because when I asked him to pray for me, I was asking, his, I was thinking he's going to call on the gods of his fathers because, like I said, he was more of an occultic man. He believes in the, the gods of his fathers and stuff like that. He was seriously deep into the occult. And as I like, Lord Jesus, let this man, my father, not start 
calling on the gods of his fathers because I am not into that. I'm praying that, you know, you give him the wisdom to, you know, to pray the right prayers over me without telling him anything. I just said, no, pray for me. He said, oh, don't worry. I keep in my prayers. I said, no, no, no. It's, it's my little sister that was present. I said, no, she means uh, my little stepsister that, that prompted him to say, no, no, she means pray for her right now. He said, oh, okay. And when I tell you my father started praying the Bible, which I never even knew that he knew the Bible. He started praying a scripture over me, said, look, my daughter, you know, those that trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion the Great, you know, they will never be defeated. He pronounced blessings upon blessings. Let whatever that was clogged in your life uh, give way. Uh, may you begin to prosper. He was declaring things that not even my mother had a chance to declare on me before she died. And I was like, wow. After he prayed, I said to him, look, you know the Bible? He said, like, yeah, I know the Bible. I was like, are you a Christian? He says, uh, I do believe in God. I do believe in God. I know he's God. He created me. But, you know, and then he started going off, you know, uh, um, that there's a lot of false prophets nowadays. Blah, 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 blah. So I, like, mm. I know a lot of people will tell you that they believe in God. But the Lord Jesus Christ is that is not their Lord and Savior because you can't see them eating their lifestyle or it's not something they've confessed. Right. So it like at the back of my mind, I was so grateful that my dad had prayed scripture over me and he kept praying scripture over me, over the little time that I, I known him. Every time I do something for him, he'll pray for me. He'll send me prayers and they'll be Bible based. I said to him, oh, how did you know the Bible? He said, oh, ba back in the day, they used to teach us the Bible. So I know scripture. So I knew he knew something about God. But here's the interesting thing. In the background, I continued to pray for him. I said, Lord, in my head, apart from God asking me to go back and get the blessing of, of the father from my father, I thought part of the assign assignment was to lead him to Christ. So I took it upon my life. I'd been praying for him over the years to, you know, to receive salvation. And God will show me certain dreams where he accepts, he would like to accept. But the kind of bondage that comes from fathers, generations. Well, I come from a generations, generations upon generations upon generations of the oak out. Like we have a, a very big shrine in the, in the, in the, uh, there's a, a very big shrine in the, uh, at the, um, the family home in the, in the village where they, they bury the ancestors and all that kind of stuff that, when we were growing up, we we're always sure that that's where our grandfather used to sit and, uh, you know, do whatever he was doing. Like he was a witch doctor or something like that. People that do that, like a native doctor. And so that was running a lot in the, in the family. So anyways, so I started praying for my father's salvation when he was still alive. I bought him a Bible and I was trying to, to creep away at him, like chip away at him. I would throw in a word here and there, and I was waiting for a moment when I, I could speak to him about Christ. But long story short, that moment never came, and my, my father died. When my, like, my father died, I'd booked a ticket. I was due to, to visit home in a few days when he died. Imagine. But there were some issues as I was debating on whether I'll see him when I go or not, because there's a, a very nasty situation that broke out right towards the end. That was a life or death kind of situation for me if I saw my dad. It was either I die or he dies. But then God made a, a decision that it, it was my time, father's dad to go instead of me. And that was also linked to um, the kind of lifestyle and the covenants he made with Satan over the years. But anyways, so after my father died, at first it really hit me, but I didn't cry like straight away. I was grieved, but not to a level because I was like, okay, I was starting to love building a relationship with my dad. But I always imagine that if my dad was to pass, I'm not going to cry as much because obviously I've not known him in so many years. And I, I didn't cry at first. It was painful and I was talking about it and I was really confused. Few weeks down the line after I visited home and on my way back to England after I'd gone to see where he had been buried, I didn't make it to the burial. He was buried before. Again, that's another story. On my way back, I had a, a long stopover in Dubai, about four or five hours. And when I, when I tell you that when I got to Dubai, I was hit with grief like never before. All of a sudden, the, the, the memories of my dad, the regret that he did not give a life to Christ, the torment of imagining and wondering where my dad is. I, I became almost angry with God. I was having back-to-back -back conversations that, Lord, how did you allow this to happen? When my mom died, I, I, I backslid. I was so angry with God for months upon, I, I turned back and I didn't want to follow God anymore because I'd asked him for just one thing that kept her alive. 
until I know enough to, you know, speak to her about salvation. I always believed that I could do it at some point, and then she died. And the, the thoughts of imagining where my mom would end up or, you know, going to heaven without her being there, it tormented me until God delivered me from him. And, you know, I, I went back to God. I said, look, I, I hand it over to you. I cannot claim to love my parents more than you love them. You created them. Before I got to know them, you knew them. So I was a cover to you, Lord. So this, I saw the same cycle repeating itself on my dad. Because all my years, after my mom died, I was like, okay, so it will be my dad that will give their life to Christ. I lost the opportunity with my mom. I will not lose it with my dad, especially when he go back in my life. And he died without me knowing whether he gave his life to Christ. And right there in Dubai, when I tell you I cry, I wailed, like I, not even crying. I cried. I would cry. I would scream like people would pass me and they're like, oh my goodness, something is very wrong with that. Uncontrollably, I sat down on this table. I cried until I soaked my entire, you know, chest with, with tears. I was so confused. I was like, Lord, how? And then I remember playing the song, um, You Waited by, uh, uh, what's this guy? Uh, 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 is it Travis Green or something like that? You, you waited. So I kept playing that. That song was on repeat over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I kept saying to myself, Lord, you gave my father a full life of over eight years. So that means you waited for him. You gave him enough opportunity to give his life to you. And I knew, like when I was crying, eventually the Lord reached out to me. I cried so much that I fell asleep. I had the alarm set for my flight to go and, you know, check in because I was in transit. And was I, I, fell, I cried so much until I fell asleep. And whilst I, I fell asleep, between sleep and awake, I had a very brief dream. But before I, I slept off, I remember the Lord ministering to me. That look godly, I waited for him. I gave him a long life. Within his long life, he had opportunity upon opportunity to hear about me. People spoke to me, to him about him, about me. He knew about me. He's not someone that never heard of me. He knew of me. And then when I slept, I remember having a dream, a very clear dream that I was standing somewhere and I saw my father. I saw him standing in an empty place. I couldn't see it had no walls on it. It was white right in front of him. I couldn't see who was on the other side of the, 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 the where, who he was facing. But I could see that it was serious business. He was facing somebody, something. But it like, it's like, like a, 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 a bright cloud or something like that. I couldn't see what's on the other side. Like it's like a light, but then it's like, I can't see what's on the other side, but I see the back of my father humbled standing before something. And I couldn't see what's on the other side or which direction he was supposed to go. Nothing. And as I looked at that vision clearly of my father, a voice spoke out to me in the dream and he said, Godly. You don't need to worry about your father. He brought a chess game before me. I've always, for some reason, kept a chess board. Um, I have it right here in front of me. It's a glass uh, table of chess. I've always had it since I've been an adult uh, living in my own home. I've always had it but for decoration purposes. I don't pers personally know how to play chess. I know some rules about the game of chess, but I don't know how to play it. But I've always kept a chess board because I've always had this feeling that chess can teach me something about life. I just thought, and it's one of the games that I like the most, even though I don't know how to play it. So the Lord brought a game of chess, a very big game of chess in front of me. And he said to me, Godly, life is like playing a game of chess. This is what the Lord told me in that dream. And he said to me, do you see those, I don't know what you call these, those things that keep the, the whatever you call these, yeah? So he said to me, each one of the, them, the reason they are shaped different, I'll compare it to a human life and how people's lives are different. Each one of them is required to make a move decided by the player on that game. And whatever move you make, you may be making it in a rush right now, but it leads to a decision. It, it determines whether you win or lose. And you are responsible for the decisions you make. He said to me, when he, when he used that the, 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 the analogy, he said to me, I want you to think about your father as someone 
that was a chess player that had every opportunity that had the control of his own destiny to move whichever direction he could move he made the decisions he made when he was alive and unfortunately every decision has an end goal has a destination just like on the, a game of chess you play based on your the knowledge that you have you think the moves you're making are going to make you win but suddenly you find out whether you lost or, or you win it will come to an end and there will be a winner and there will be a loser because each decision we make every step we make accounts for something but the problem we have okay so he explained that to me and when he was explaining it to me also what i was hearing in my spirit is that it's not your responsibility to worry about your father in as much as you wanted salvation for him it is no your decision to accept christ for him if he never accepted christ don't think he never had the opportunity to god knew his entire life he knew the opportunities he put in front of him now i'm not saying this because i've not been around my father i don't know for definite if he ever gave his life to christ or not but i'm just going by the lifestyle the type of lifestyle he led that even led to his death that to me it was telling me that this is not somebody that lived as though if they knew god then they never really honored him as god i would think and i'm not trying to judge my father in any way i'm just explaining to you the levels that i went through grieving for him i was asking myself so many questions and it's as if i wanted god to tell me is my father did he give his life to Christ? Because sometimes people have but then along the way they they fail to live according you know to his what's it but they have given their life to him and I wanted to know, as if I wanted to know the destiny, because the same thing, like I said, the psych I went through with my mom, wandering, imagining heaven without my mom, in, because we both made different decisions. I was imagining the same for my dad. But unfortunately, that decision is left with the Almighty God. He wasn't going to show me that this is where your dad is going to end up. But what he said to me was, God, be rest assured that he had every opportunity to play the game of life. Whatever decisions he's made, there comes a time in life where... The life ends as we know it. And you go to a place where your mouth can no longer speak for you. And it's your actions, the decisions you made, the things you did on earth. Are the only thing that is left to speak. Because you can't speak in that place. It's done and dusted. The day that everything is rolled away, it is over. It's your works now that are going to determine. And like uh, 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 the book of Amos says that prepare to meet your maker. When I saw that vision... I was like, indeed, my dad is before his maker. The time has been rolled away, and what's left now is him to stand before his maker. I also thought about the great white throne that the Bible talks about. I didn't see anything in the shape of throne, but because where he, he stood was all purity, where I could, like I said, I could only see his backside when the, the Lord now was explaining to me that, look, let go of this grief. It is not your responsibility. You did your part. To you, it may not look like you had a chance to preach to him. But that doesn't mean that nobody else did. There are many times people are going through what I've gone through, grieving for the life of a, a family member that they didn't manage to reach. But also what you should understand is that sometimes people are given the opportunity, but they just will not believe. They don't want to believe. And that's totally fine because it's their decision at the end of the day. If God won't make it for them, who am I to make it for them? You see, the are people have heard of a story of a woman that was crying so much over her dad. She had tried to preach to him even up to the very end of his death. The only thing the dad managed to do was to get up and say, listen, you keep talking to me about this, your God. I don't want to know if I die right now and go to hell, so be it. Stop. I did not accept him when I was in good health. Don't think you convince me now because of the pain that I will accept him. He was determined not to believe. And I've come to understand that there are people who will not believe. It's just not on the cards for them to believe in Christ. Not because God doesn't want, because he says in his word that he wills that every man, you know, will make heaven that will come to him. But it's just not possible for everybody. And we all have a responsibility to, to choose life or death. Choose one. Choose life that you may live. But anyways, I don't know, without making this very long. So the Lord explained that thing to me. It was difficult for me to swallow. But I swallowed it. And I said, Lord, I, I feel the pain of my loved one going to a place that I cannot imagine because I didn't preach the gospel to them. But the Lord said, okay, they had many opportunities. You don't know who I sent to them. But the Bible also tells us to, 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 to not only, if we can't reach out to them, pray that God will send someone that they will listen to. 
Because sometimes our near and dear will not receive from us. But that doesn't mean they will not receive the gospel from someone else. It may not be that they will listen to, but they may be able to listen to someone else. You see, so we can't be discouraged. If they won't listen to you, if they won't have the gospel from you, pray that they will get it from someone else. And you know, life is so fragile. None of us is here forever. Our loved ones are not here forever. When we get a chance to preach to them or to tell them that, look, this is the right way, may we find the grace as difficult as it is and knowing that we are the last people they want to believe or listen to, may we find the it in, within us to, you know, to speak to them. Now, over the years, I've seen, like here in England, we have a lot of churches that will do good works. They have food parcels, blankets for the homeless. They just walk into the church and receive all these gifts from them. They receive what they need. But the, the biggest mistake is that nobody opens their mouth to speak to them about Christ. Now, the truth of the matter is that you can give someone all the best things, or you can meet all their needs as they want, but you cannot love people into heaven. If you never open your mouth to speak the word of God towards them, to, to tell them about Christ, to lead them to salvation, the love you're showing them through actions, it will never get them to heaven. Because the Bible makes it very clear. You have to be born again. You have to speak with your mouth. With the mouth, a confession is made. And with, with, your, with your heart, you have to believe, you know, and you have to confess him with your mouth that he is Lord. You have to make him your savior. You cannot expect to spend eternity with someone that was never your savior. If you never chose him in life, you cannot choose him when you're dead. If you never accepted salvation when you are alive, it's not going to be forced on you after you're dead. You made your decision when you were alive. You, you didn't want him. You never chose him. You know. So what I want to encourage somebody here. For me, that saying, life is like playing a game of chess. It, it, see, because of what God showed me and me seeing it on a, on a cover of a journal, it really brought back a lot of memories. Because just like when a person is playing a game of chess, you're making decisions, a lot of the decisions concentrating on the here and now. Oh, I can go this direction. How do I, you're only seeing what is coming up right next to you. But we forget that we are in this life, in this world, but we are not of this world. We make quick decisions without thinking about the future. But we should leave decisions every day, life, making decisions that will uh, uh, make that, 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 that amount up to the final end. If you could die today, if you were to die today, where would you end up? Let's not wait until it's too late because we must know that the daily routine, if I want to save a lot of money at the end of the year, but every single day I'm spending a lot of money on things that I don't need like shoes and, you know, bags and stuff. And that sounds like me, right? It's not going to get me to the final goal of what I want, right? If I'm, I want to lose weight, but my daily diet is so unhealthy. Tomorrow, a few years down the line, you cannot have good health because the little decisions eventually add up. You get to the old age and wonder why, why, is, why do you have very poor health? But the decisions you made on a daily basis, day in, day out, they brought you to where you are. Just like in the game of chess, as you're making quick decisions right now, you have to remember that the time is coming when all the decisions you've made collectively are going to come to full cycle. Full cycle. And they're going to decide the final decision for you of where people that have made the type of decisions that like you, you have are supposed to end up. So glory to God that he used that dream to explain to me that this is how it is. I need you to let go of the grief you're feeling. I need you to know that in as much as you felt that responsibility, it was never all on you. He had choices. And I'm not going to tell you where he will end up right now. But whatever game he played in his life when he was alive, in the end, will determine the outcome. So, I want to thank you very much. I want you to think, uh, as I will think also about this game of chess. Um, I was so surprised that he said thing. The people of the world already knew about this, but I didn't know. Like I said, it took the Almighty God to tell me that this is how it is. May we live our daily routine every day doing things that are mounting up to, 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 to where we want to end up. Just like the word of God says in Jeremiah that I know the plans that I have for you. They are plans of good and not of evil to bring you to the expected end. 
know our own expected end, but the expected end according to God. He has an expected end in his mind for each one of us. And may we live a life that brings us to the end that he expects for us, that he has planned for us. You know, he, that his thoughts for us are of good and not of evil. You see, which means the end for us is a good one. It's not supposed to be an evil one. So thank you very much, guys. Have the rest. Um, have a, a, a lovely Sunday. Um, it's almost uh, a evening time down here. But whatever you're doing, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And I'll speak to you next week. Bye.